Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and I'm here today at the Rock Island Auction Company, where we are taking a look at a Vickers Berthier model of 1919 semi-automatic rifle. Now, it's a model of 1919 according to the markings on the receiver, but this is actually, I believe, the rifle that was tested by the US military in November of 1921. This search for a new American semi-automatic rifle began in 1919 with the, the formation of an infantry and cavalry board, a, a board of officers, uh, to basically take a look at, at lessons learned from World War I, not just from the American fighting, but from the entire conflict, and to look at you know, this was the biggest, most devastating conflict in human history. What can we learn about it for military preparations for the future? And of course, one of the things that comes up in that is semi-automatic infantry rifles. Uh, World War I had seen the first actual large-scale use of semi-automatic rifles, the French RSC rifles, and the US had actually tested those during the war, but didn't take any steps to actually put them into production or procure them. So, by 1919 there you know, we're, we're assessing the war, we're looking at what can we get, and one of the things that they set up is a trial for semi-automatic rifles. And the first one that actually happens is in May of 1920. And that is the first trial that starts to incorporate some of the names that would come back over and over again until ultimately the M1 Garand was finally perfected and adopted. So this first trial in May of 1920 included the first Garand rifle, a rotating bolt primer activated gun. It included a Thompson auto rifle. It included uh, this guy, or, well, I'm sorry, it included a predecessor to this guy, and we'll touch on this in just a moment. Uh, also included the Hatcher Bang rifle, which was a modified version of the Bang. Um, this one is was the, the design of the French general André Berthier, the same Berthier who designed the bolt-action rifles. And he had actually put together a machine gun design, in fact, before World War I. It was never fine-tuned enough, it was never polished enough to go into actual service during World War I. It was uh, or, uh, presented to the US military in 1917. They did some testing and didn't really see it as something ready for combat. But when they came back in 1919 and 1920 and said, hey, we're looking for a self-loading rifle, Berthier went ahead and took his light machine gun, 24 pounds, something like that, and adapted it, or I should say his open bolt, full auto light machine gun, and adapted it into a semi-automatic closed bolt 10 pound shoulder rifle, a little over 10 pounds, and he submitted that to the trials. Now on paper that sounds good, but this was an awkward handling rifle, it had some parts breakage issues, it wasn't really very well adapted. It was still like too much of a lightened light machine gun, and not so much of a purpose-built self-loading rifle. So. Uh, there is like one picture out there that I'm aware of of that first pattern of Berthier rifle, and the most distinctive thing about it is that the stock and the gas system goes all the way right out to the muzzle. This was clearly one of the things that the trials report said they didn't like so much, and so when a second trial came up a year and a half later, in November of 1921, Berthier submitted a slightly revised version of that rifle, and that is this rifle. Now this was produced, or actually manufactured, by the Vickers company, as it says here on the receiver. It was actually submitted to trials by a company called the United States Machine Gun Company, which I don't have any details on. It seems it was almost certainly basically a front company for Vickers or Berthier, or the two of them combined. Probably something put together to make the gun sound a little more domestic American, to make it a little more palatable. On the other hand, it says right here, Vickers Limited, System Berthier. So exactly what the story is with the US Machine Gun Company, I can't tell you, unfortunately. What I can tell you is that the collaboration between the Vickers Company in England and André Berthier would continue and would become fairly successful uh, with the design of, well, taking this back to its original configuration as a light machine gun, it became the Vickers Berthier light machine gun, where it was adopted by a number of countries, including most substantially India, and they made many thousands of them for the Indian Army, as well as some other forces. So eventually this thing would find a successful role, just not as a shoulder-fired rifle. So uh, what we have here is a very much a one-of-a-kind prototype. This is mostly serial number one. It's got a single part in there that's serial number two, which I suspect is because of parts breakage requiring them to scrounge parts from a second prototype that was on hand. Uh, and what we need to do at this point is, without any doubt, take this apart and show you how it works. Because it looks pretty awkward, 
but it's actually a little bit better inside than you'd expect from this weird configuration. We'll go ahead and start with the markings here, just on the top rear end of the receiver. Very nicely hand engraved there, Vickers Limited, System A André Berthier, model of 1919. And something I probably should have been a little clearer about uh, in my introduction there is that this is a top-fed rifle. So it would have had a detachable magazine right here. Obviously you can see the magazine well. This is the magazine retaining catch. Uh, however, unfortunately the magazine is lost to time. Uh, even the original trials photos of this rifle don't show the magazine. So I don't know what happened to the magazine, but I suspect that magazine has been out of commission for nearly a hundred years. Nearly, uh, nearly since like the actual date of the testing. Uh, so that's a shame, but... Now we have a couple controls on here to take a look at. One of them is this little lever here. And first off, I should point out that both of the control levers we're going to look at double as disassembly levers. So that's actually kind of a cool element to the gun. This guy, as long as you push it forward, it basically prevents anything from, do, from happening. So when it's forward, you can cycle the bolt back. You can see that come back here. It's a closed bolt gun as a shoulder-fired rifle. So uh, it goes all the way forward, bolt locks into battery, it's ready to fire. And then, interestingly, this has an operating mechanism rather like uh, a Lewis gun, aka FG42, aka M60 in that the firing pin is fixed to the operating rod, which is connected to the bolt handle here. So when I pull the trigger, the whole thing's actually going to jump forward. And that's when the fixed firing pin goes forward inside the bolt. The bolt's locked and immobile this whole time. Firing pin jumps forward, fires the cartridge, and then you know, gas system takes over. So as long as this lever back here is in the forward position, it just cycles normally. If I pop this to its rearward position, which is vertical as opposed to just slightly forward. Now it locks the bolt open. And basically what this is doing is this is a little spring-loaded hook that catches on the operating rod. When the lever's forward, uh, it just pushes this hook out of engagement and prevents it from catching. Uh, so now we've got the gun locked open. You actually have to do this uh, as part of the disassembly process. So we'll get to that in a minute. But before we do, let me go ahead. This will act as a bolt release when I push it forward. Like so. So you can see it pushes this uh, outward like that, which unhooks. You'll see that hook when we take it apart. Now the other lever on here is this one. This acts as a safety. So in the upward position it's in the fire position. Uh, works normally. When I flip it down, it does this interesting thing where it actually uh, basically engages locks in a half-moon cutout in the op rod, which holds the op rod in place, which means I can still click the trigger, but this pin is now holding the whole operating rod in position, which means it can't jump forward to fire. So that's effectively the safe position. Because it's locking uh, the op rod in position, it also means that you can't move the bolt. So with this in the safe position, I can't open the action either. So really a remarkable multi-function safety system, but very simple mechanically. Now uh, that's pretty much it for controls. There's one other thing to take a look at. Well, I guess there are a couple. Um, first off are the sights. This is a rear aperture sight. Uh, we can push this in and elevate and depress the sight, although there are no markings on it. This is still a prototype rifle. You know, you get the thing working mechanically, but there's no need to bother putting in the time and effort uh, to, to put on exact gradations when you're just, you know, this is going in for endurance and reliability testing. If it passes that, then you can mark up the sights for exact ranges later. Uh, the sight is offset to the left, of course, because you have a central top-mounted magazine. We have a cheek rest on the side of the gun uh, to bring your line of sight over in line with this offset sight. And of course the front sight is also offset to the left to line up with the rear sight. So uh, nice little blade sight out there. You can see that that is adjustable for windage. Unfortunately, those offset sights and this 
long grip. This has a kind of a long length of pull. The whole gun feels awkwardly long. The receiver is quite long. You know, the barrel only starts like here. The chamber starts here. So you've got this really long receiver relative to comparable other guns, or at least it feels like a very long receiver. Now one of the other issues with this rifle is that, uh, well, the stock was a bit fragile. And we can tell that because this isn't supposed to be open. This is supposed to be covered. And you can actually see the back of the cap here where the, the wood originally came up over the top of this tube and enclosed this. But you can see how thin it got back here. And at some point it just snapped, sheared this whole top section off. So the gun originally handled a, or looked a little bit nicer and cleaner than it does now. In fact, you can still see an additional crack right there. And I presume what did that was the fact that you have this recoil tube back here, bottom of the, uh, or back end of the op rod basically, that is cycling all the way back in and out of here. And if you didn't cut it quite right, um, if that was hitting on the back end of the, the recess in the stock, I can easily see how that would start cracks and cause a failure like this to happen. So with that, uh, all of that looked at, let's go ahead and take this apart. Because for as weird as this gun looks, it actually comes apart really quite easily. So we're going to start by locking the bolt open. So I will put this in the locked open position. There we go. Lock the bolt open. Now we're going to go ahead and take this pin out, rotate it to the safe position, and then a little bit farther. You can see right there there's a little key on it. And now I can pull it out. Note that there's a cutout here. We'll get to that in a minute. One of the other things that that pin does is physically hold this entire handguard in place. Because we've got this little semicircular cutout at the back of the handguard. With that pin gone, I can now slide this back, out of engagement with the front nose cap here, and then pop it down, and completely off the rifle. We've got a, a relatively thick uh, heat shield in there, which is a good thing, because as you'll see, gas vents directly into this when you fire. Uh, other than that, all this is doing is covering up um, the internal parts of the rifle. So we'll set this aside. Now you can see the gas system here. So I'm going to go ahead and gently drop the slide down, drop the bolt handle down, and you can see our gas piston here go all the way forward into that gas port. There we go. Now with the handguard removed I can actually just take the bolt handle clean off. So if I push in on the top, you can see that that little thing comes down, bolt handle comes off. What the bolt handle actually does here is interact with this tube up here. You can see this, this lug locks onto this little flange on the tube, and when you pull the handle back it pulls this tube back. Now we have our gas piston and op rod here inside the spring. And we need to take this off, but in order to do that we have to pull the whole assembly out the back of the rifle. And in order to get to it, well first we have to take off the stock. So that's also quite easy. This rear pin is a threaded pin, so we unscrew that. This is very similar to what you would later see in the Vickers Berthier machine gun. I can pull that pin out, and then the stock assembly just pivots out of the gun. So it's got this little tab on the top that locks into a little recess in the receiver to lock that in place. That's the whole stock. Originally you can see a hole here where the, the back end of the recoil of the op rod went when the thing was cycling, which has now sheared open. And now the whole back end of the receiver is open. This again, very much like the later machine gun. However, the op rod is being held back by the trigger. So I'm going to go ahead and drop the trigger. There we go. Once that's dropped, now the trigger just comes out as a little pack. There's basically nothing to it here. It's just a semi-auto only dropping sear. That's it. Put that aside. 
Now, in order to take the bolt and the op rod out of the action, we have to disconnect the recoil spring. And what's interesting here is the recoil spring is running from, uh, it's running on top of the op rod, from the front of the receiver here, into this tube, and we have this little pin right there. That pin is locking this tube on the outside into the op rod on the inside, and that locks the recoil spring in place. So if I pull this back just a little bit to take tension off of it, I can then pull out that pin, which appears to do nothing, but what that's done is disconnected the op rod from the spring. Now I'm going to use a screwdriver just as a little helper tool to push back on the op rod here. Now this will slide back without compressing the spring. And once I get it, you can see the bolt there travelling with the op rod. So the op rod's coming out the back. We can also see it travelling up here. I'm going to hold on to this to make sure it doesn't slip. And there's the little hole that the pin was in. Keep going. There is the head of the gas piston with its sealing rings. That click was the bolt locking into the hold open catch. And now I have this just balanced on spring pressure, so I can pull this off to the side, remove the recoil spring. So that comes out, pull that tube off, and pull off the recoil spring. Now you can see our whole op rod assembly there. I mean, this thing is really long. If I put it at an angle like that, you can see it. Here we can then pull this whole assembly out of the receiver. And there's the whole thing. Now if you've seen a Vickers Berthier machine gun, you will absolutely recognize this bolt. Um, it's not quite identical, but it has some features that sure do look the same. So this little spring-loaded piece on top, that's what actually feeds a cartridge. Remember the magazine is located on top. That pushes up enough to catch the rim of a cartridge to push it down into the gun. And then it can get compressed down on top, so you don't need any extra space when the thing's locked into battery. As for the actual locking, well, we have... let me pull this out first. We have the firing pin fixed here, although it's kind of a little wobbly. Um, it's fixed in place, but if you take out this screw you can remove the firing pin to replace it, which is a really good idea. And we have a pair of cams right here on either side of this firing pin block, and those cams run in this track on the inside of the bolt body. So when this is in position... There we go. So this is the locked position. What we have is the back half of the bolt pivots up and down. So as this travels forward, right there, you can see that these cams are operating in those two grooves, pulling the back end of the bolt up and down. So up and back down. Down is unlocked, and up is locked. So what happens here is when you've got a spring pushing forward on... Um, or pulling forward on this op rod. So it's going to pull it all the way forward, which is going to lock this in the upward position. This surface right here locks up into the receiver. That puts the whole thing, well, locked and in battery. And then when you fire, this gas piston gets pushed backwards. This gives you dwell time for pressure to drop and the bullet to leave the barrel. And when it gets back to this point, now it's going to pull the rear end of the bolt down. Once it's all the way down, it can't go any further, and then the whole thing cycles backward, which extracts the empty cartridge. And uh, once it's at full compression, it'll come back the other way and load a new cartridge. Now on the later Vickers Berthier machine gun, they would get rid of this, um, the whole two-part pivoting bolt. Uh, they figured out, you know what, we can simplify this, we can actually have the whole bolt tilt, we don't have to separate the front and back. But with this level, at this point in the design, they hadn't figured that out. So we have a two-part bolt here, there's the rear part. We have, interestingly, this little interface piece. Um, this was probably made separately just to simplify the machining operations. Easier to cut that curved surface in a separate piece than to try and do it in the middle of this thing. Note that the bolt head here is serial number 2, where every other numbered part on this gun is number 1. So 
like I said earlier, I suspect they uh, broke a bolt during the, one of the firing trials and had to drop in the bolt from their backup gun. But that's the bolt head, got a cut out there for the ejector. In fact, I need to show you the ejector. The ejector is right here, and it's another removable piece. As you fire, it's going to pivot in and out. But you can see that square lock in a round hole there. If we push it in, use my screwdriver again here. If I push it all the way in like that, I can then pull this whole thing out. So there's the ejector as a single removable piece. That's a really good idea. Um, you of course have to have the bolt out of the gun or, or pulled you know, part way out in order to replace this, because it has to pivot all the way in like that to go in. Now we've got a couple features on the back of the operating rod here that I want to explain, because they're actually kind of pretty cool. So first off, on the side, right here, we have a big old cutout notch. That is the bolt hold open notch. So that gets hooked by this spring-loaded catch. And so as long as you have the, uh, the lever back here holding this out, it won't hold the bolt open. When you allow it to, that hook snaps into that. That's what locks the bolt. Locks the bolt open, I should say. Next, we have these two positions. This one actually, as far as I can tell, does nothing. I suspect this is a modification of an earlier part from another gun, and it already had that cut in it, and so they left it in there. Because the part that actually does the work is this hook. And that is what the trigger mates up against, like this. So when we have this in the receiver, like so, we'll go ahead and slide the trigger into its uh, dovetail. Note that that's hooked, basically hooked into the op rod right there. So as we push one in, they both go in. And then they're going to bottom out right there. That's the cocked position. So you can see that the back end of the tube is stuck here. If I push on this, like the recoil spring would, and then pull the trigger, now that can go all the way in. You can see that a little bit better up here at the gas port. So there's our gas piston, it goes in, that's where it stops, ready to fire. And then when I pull the trigger, it's able to drop down to that position. Um, that slams the firing pin forward, right down here. So in the cocked position, it's right there. And then when I pull the trigger, that drops forward like so, thus firing the rifle very much like the semi-auto mode on a Lewis, well, semi-auto mode on an FG42, which was copied from the Lewis gun, which actually predated this. Uh, or at least this iteration of the Berthier. Whether the very early Berthiers used this same fixed firing pin system, I can't tell you, because I've never looked at one of those. But that's how that works. Then once the gun cycles, it's going to reset, re-catch the trigger. If I engage the safety at that point, this point, then you saw that half moon cutout. In this position, that half moon cutout in this pin allows the op rod to move back and forth. Once I put it into the safe position here, it is engaging. You'll notice it's actually pushing the op rod slightly back, which means, do that again so you can see, when I engage the safety, the op rod goes, gets pushed back just a little bit, which means the trigger is no longer in contact. Even if I push on this, um, this is being held in place by that safety lever. So like I said, really a pretty clever little system. A few other little bits to show you here. First off, the barrel is actually relatively heavy and fluted, deeply fluted, uh, under the handguard. That's, that's pretty cool. Don't know if you're going to be able to see it, but the locking surface is actually right up there, right above my fingernail, right there. So right in the top of the receiver here is where the bolt pivots up to lock. You can just barely yeah, there you go. You can just barely see the locking surface there. And then the gas system at the front is just a very simple gas port pinned onto the barrel. Uh, and there's a plug at the front, so you can clean out the gas port by unscrewing that, taking the plug out, scrubbing out this gas cylinder, um, and then reassembling it, uh, having it all set to work again. 
I suspect this barrel is also uh, repurposed from a previous gun, because that crosspin hole has no purpose in this gun. In fact, neither does that crosspin hole. So I suspect these were from an earlier iteration of the gun. For all I know, the gas port may very well have been under the front sight here, and they just covered it over to seal it up. But uh, yeah, a feature like that, it's got, it's got no reason to be here, and this is clearly a very specific fluted barrel for this rifle, which tells me, you know, if there's no reason to have it, you don't cut it. And so this must have come from an earlier pattern of gun where there was a reason to have it. All right, there is Field Stripped 1, model of 1919, second pattern, Vickers Berthier semi-automatic shoulder rifle. So at the end of the 1921 trials, the testing report, the officers, their conclusion was, look, he didn't really change much from the 1920 gun. Like, yeah, you shortened the gas system, but that's kind of it. Uh, we still don't like the top-mounted magazine, we don't like the offset sights, we don't like the fact that it broke a bunch of parts. They specifically called out the extractor, or the ejector spring, ex I'm sorry, they specifically called out the extractor spring and the ejector and other parts. Uh, so clearly there was a bunch of breakage going on. If my suspicion, it also probably broke a bolt head, because that one's been replaced with serial number two. And just handling this gun, it doesn't feel good. It's, it's long, the length of pull is weird. Had they, that they, the trials report left open the possibility that if there were like substantial and unexpected, unpredicted changes to the gun, then maybe it would be worth trying again. But short of that, forget it. Like we've tried this twice, we still don't like it. Don't bother, <laughs> don't, don't waste our time with this again. So, Vickers and Berthier never did. This wouldn't show up in any further US testing, and instead they would go back, as I said in the introduction, they'd go back to working on it as a light machine gun. And in that role, this system really did come through as something viable and fairly successful. So uh, it is very cool to be able to take a look at one of the actual US trials semi-automatic rifles. If you'd be interested in having this in your own personal collection, well, it is coming up for sale at the Rock Island Auction Company. So if you take a look at the description text below, you'll find a link to ForgottenWeapons.com, and from that page you can link on over to Rock Island's catalog page on this rifle. That'll, link, that'll give you their high-res pictures, their description, their price estimate, all that sort of good stuff. And uh, if you're interested, hey, have a go at it. So you'll certainly be the first one on your block with a 1919 Vickers Berthier rifle. Thanks for watching.